Hey, welcome back to Talking Sass. Tonight, my guest, one of a kind. She's been featured on sportsillustrated.com. She's been featured on ESPN.com. She's a feud I can never live down because I decapitated her doll and almost her in the process but she's the first lady of hardcore. She is the innovator of intergender. And quite frankly, I think she's damn near indestructible. This is Lufisto. <laughs> Hi, what a great intro. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, you did kill my doll. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you that was what, like four or five years ago. And I still get people that message me like, I can't believe you killed Peekaboo. You are such a, put your, your own imagination in the words here. It's crazy. Your fans are legit <laughs> die hard. And, and with the Peekaboo thing, it's like, I'm almost like sometimes uncomfortable because they still ask about her and I'm like, you know, she was a plastic doll, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, I still have her. She's in a, you know, those living dead dolls casket. I have yeah. one and I just put her in there. She's somewhere up in, in one of my closets. But yeah, it's like, oh, I miss Pegaboo. Are you ever bringing back Pegaboo? I'm like, I'm 40 years old. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's insane. Like, it, like you said, it was a doll, but for quite a long period of time in your career, she was like your little mascot, I guess is the best way to put it. You would have her in the corner. You would talk to her during matches. I would you know, listen to her and use her <laughs> in matches and she was supposed to be a one-time deal because uh, I I was um, I was working for Ring of Honor in Montreal, was working Daisy Hayes and they were like, you need to be heel. But since Shimmer was kind of connected to Ring of Honor back then, I have to keep my character. And I asked Dave Prezak, I'm like, what am I doing? I'm so bubbly and everything. He's like, keep the anime, but kind of make it weird maybe or something like so people know you're a heel. So I was watching the Adams family and Wednesday she has a doll and then she looks at her brother and she removes her head and it's so creepy. I'm like, that's what I need. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to buy a cheap doll at Zellers that's not even existing anymore, like the old Canadian Walmart or something. And I uh, painted makeup on her with a Sharpie. I made her a dress with one of my socks. <laughs> and that's how the match started I'm like this is Peggy Boone she doesn't like you removed her head put it in Daisy's hand she's like Ugh! and then I punched her <laughs> but the doll was so over people were chanting Peggy Boo, and I'm like oh what's going on and she was like I got stuck with her for five years because of that. <laughs> she was more over than I was like she had more chance than Lufisto <laughs> <laughs> and that's hard to imagine because like I said your fan base is insane like I, I I'm I, really grateful for that yeah yeah but like I'll see you voice your opinion on something whatever it happens to be that day or you know at that time and somebody disagrees with you and like your fans especially on Twitter <laughs> will come back and be like do not insult Lofisto like <laughs> it's insane it, and I said it, that like six times it's insane but really it is like it's crazy it's it's something that I've always like it's it's a good thing and a bad thing, but I've, written, I've pretty much been an open book my whole career. When If I wasn't feeling good, I would express it. If I was feeling great, I would also. I think it makes us human to share that with the fans. And uh, it's like when, when I had my cancer and I also talked that I had depression and I kind of put it out there, it made me feel good to actually talk about it. But there's so many people who reached out Especially when it comes to the, the, the depression side, I had like tons of people from the army who would send me like long emails saying that knowing that I was going through this because they had PTHD and they had like horrible stories and like visions in their minds and they would share that with me. And I felt so grateful for them to trusting me with their stories. And it was only because I put mine out there. So if I helped a few people sharing what I was feeling I mean it, internet is good sometimes it's just not bullying whatever people share stories they support each other and I, I think it's one of the main reasons why I, I have fans that will defend me because I, I go out there I, I say what's on my mind 
even if it's a bad situation, but at least they know that, you know, I'm going through something and maybe they are in their lives and they can connect with me and, and find like similarities as human beings. Cause I mean, yes, we're wrestlers. We look like superhero. We throw ourselves <laughs> everywhere in the ring and, and tables or whatever. But at, at the end of the day, we go back home and we're human. Of course. Absolutely. And I think for me, when like, I noticed your fans talking on, on your behalf, basically is because you are so relatable and you put yourself out there for everybody to, you know, see who you are genuinely, not just as Lufisto, but you as a person as well and what you're going through. And I think that people will attach to that because they relate. And I think that's another reason why people connect with you so much is because you're going through depression or we're going through depression and so are so many other people. Mm -hmm. You're a survivor of cancer and other people might be going through cancer or have survived cancer and they can relate to that or they know mm -hmm. somebody who has done that as well. So I think, I mean, maybe just my opinion, but I think that's a, not a lot, but part of the reason why so many people are so dedicated to who you are. Yeah, I think so too. And, I, and since the beginning of, of my career, I always made you know, a constant effort to answer every message, every email. Sometimes it's hard because you get a lot, but I, one day I'm just going to sit down, go through all my, my emails and answer everybody. Then I'm going to go on my Facebook and answer everybody. Uh, I'm going to go on Twitter and do the same in Instagram. Even for a while, I, I had to close my DMs because I had like so many weird messages. I'm like, I can't take this anymore. <laughs> but finally, like things calmed down. And I was also receiving death threats and, and people sending me like hate mail, this, especially with the CCW situation. So I was like, OK, so I closed all my DMs. But recently I opened up and like them, like the DMs again and so far so good like I get like great messages and cool people talking to me so I take the t I always say you take the time to write I will take the time to answer and that's fantastic and that's actually something I want to get into with you is the whole CCW thing mm -hmm. because you have pretty much the majority of your career starts with well not starts with but mm -hmm. is with CCW yep. you're the only woman to be in cage of death still to this day mm -hmm. that's like I said you're pretty much you know, indestructible here. I mean, you've been through pretty much everything. I couldn't imagine going through Cage of Death. Like, I remember watching some of them when I was there and I had to turn my back because they're <laughs> so violent and I couldn't stomach it. I was like, oh my God, I'm literally going to be sick. So, <laughs> but I mean, you've done Cage of Death. You have wrestled there countless times. You were inducted into their Hall of Fame uh, was last year, I believe. Yeah, 2019. And then... Then this year, we have the whole debacle of yeah. labeling not only CCW, but their sister mm -hmm. company, WSU, mm -hmm. and putting our matches out there as if we were porn stars and mm -hmm. labeling them as like big boob cat fights. <laughs> yeah. Hot and sweaty cat fights and double D destructions. Um, what was it? The <laughs> assets or something. Uh, anyway. This is like so many terrible titles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But how, how do you deal with that? I mean, like I said, you have history there, you're in their hall of fame and then they just totally disrespect women's wrestling and you by putting these names on our matches when we're hard fought athletes. I, I wish people would understand like the, like the roller coaster of emotion I had when this happened because at first I saw it because a fan called it out. It's like, I can't believe you're calling Mercedes Martinez versus Lopisto a sweaty cat fight with big assets or whatever the, what the name was. And then I'm, he sends me the link. I look into it and I'm like, I just, I was so disappointed. I'm like, if there's a place that knows all the struggle I had to go through to be respected, the pain and the, you know, people who stiff me, who, everything like that I've worked so hard to prove that women could do it too and got into the hardcore and it's like this place knows they know the the whole road to get where we are today because it happened under their eyes so I was like oh I'm like so all I did is I I took an image of 
what they were saying. And I said, really, CCW, why would you do this? And then CCW sent me messages on uh, Twitter DM. And I'm still not sure who was talking to me. I don't even know if it's DJ or someone else. And it was like, oh, we know we respect you. We sold it to a third party. We can't do anything. I'm like, the hell you can't do anything. This is your name. This is your company. You know the history of, of intergender wrestling. And how can you do this? And it was just like brushing their hands and we don't care. And I was like so disappointed. And because I was like, yes, I have such a rich and strong history with them. I'm like, they know it's bothering me. The fans have been starting to be vocal that it's wrong. I'm going to wait and I'll see what they do. So I wait a month. I wait two months. They do it after the first month. And then after two months, they do it again. And then they post pictures. They were for the DVD or whatever they, they were releasing. I think it was from the Breaking Barrier or United, or I don't know what was the original title. But they literally took captures of each and every one of us bend over showing our asses and that's what they were selling girls fighting with all their assets out or whatever i can't remember the real title but i was like no this is unacceptable like I, i've waited two months and i got i gotta try to call them out publicly now because obviously privately didn't do anything they didn't care but i my main thing was like their girls need to know that this is happening and then when they wrestle there, that's what they will do with their image. Because I'm sure you remember when WSU was sold to CCW and that Blake Thomas was the booker and everything, they promised that this would be the shimmer of the East Coast. We're going to take this seriously. We want this to be serious. Like they sold us WSU like if it was going to be the best thing for women's wrestlers. Mm -hmm. So by them doing that, I was like, not only you lied to us, but you are going back on your promise and you sell her image the way, like, I remember perfectly that I signed up for a wrestling event, not being portrayed as a pornographic actress or a cat fighter. I'm a professional wrestler and that's how I should be branded. And it was like, that's why I called them out. I tried to do it as professional as I could, but I mean, it wasn't really hard. It was like, you're, it's so wrong what you're doing to the girls. You promised us completely something else. And now you're just like, I don't care. I'm selling this and we're going to brand you like this. And so, yeah, it was indeed to go back to the beginning of your question. It was such a struggle and when I filmed my videos, I probably started over like 10, 20 times because I was like, <sighs> like it, I was mad, I was sad, I was pissed and so disappointed, like even like disgusted. I'm like, why would you do this? Especially when you know the background. It's, yeah. Yeah, I know, like, at that time, like you said, with Blake, who was at the time writing a lot of the storylines and helping mm -hmm. out backstage with photo photos and everything, good friend of mine still to this day. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was an amazing time for WSU. We're bringing in, I've been a part of WSU uh, probably about three years after they got started till about probably mm -hmm. three years ago. So I was there for quite, quite a bit of time, like a, probably about 10 years. Mm -hmm. And from where it went when the Mick first had it, which I know, I don't think you ever were a part of it when Mick. I've, I've worked like one or two shows with Mick and then it was, it was DJ. sold. Yeah. Yeah. So that was amazing. Cause I felt like WSU when I first got there was like this kind of like underground, cool, like hardcore, but not like over hardcore but like you could show different things there like it was women yeah. superstars uncensored and that's mm -hmm. what it was and I loved it mm -hmm. and then when it started switching when DJ well um the guy from beyond had it first Drew, Drew. yeah first it was Drew yes we were there from beyond and DJ yeah and obviously they could not work together no uh, it lasted what two or three shows and then Drew was like oh. <laughs> fuck it <laughs> and I, I mean i understand yeah. and um i've worked with drew after for beyond 
has always been an amazing human being, gave me like great matches. So easy to work with too. I mean, mm-hmm. Real Wrestling is always great. Um, but yeah, WSU, Blake, Blake Thomas, awesome guy. Loved working with him. He was so passionate about every single woman who was working for him and would take beautiful pictures and make sure we were doing promos. So we had a, like a complete, um, like the show was complete promos, pictures, uh, uh, storylines and matches. Like, like he was working really hard. Yeah, he was running it, in my opinion, like it was one of the TV, the mm-hmm. pro, uh, promotions already on TV. Yep. Like yep. he wanted everything the way that it needed to be. So they could put that on a platform mm-hmm. that was bigger than what it was. But then unfortunately, mm-hmm. it went to this other platform where it's just like, okay, you have these women who are amazing talents. And yeah, of course, a lot of us are beautiful too, but that's not what sells what we want to sell. It helps, but we want you to watch our matches because we're talented. We're doing things that you didn't expect women to do, that we're athletic. We want these reasons to be the reasons why you tune in, not because we have big butts or big tits or whatever the case. Yeah, and so many people like kind of mixed up everything. And sometimes it was like, it was really hard to deal with because we're people were like, "Oh, you guys are hypocrite because you wear, you know, skimpy outfit and whatever." I'm sorry. And I was like, "I'm sorry, but guys wear less than us." First of all, second of all, if a girl wants to sell sexy picture in her home time and she wants to do a side project or whatever or news or stuff, that's her thing. She can do whatever she wants. If she's a stripper by night, it's fine. It's her job. It doesn't matter. This is not wrestling, you know, related. As a woman, she can choose to do whatever she wants to make money. The problem here is that when we signed up for WSU, we signed up for professional wrestling. If I want to sell naked pictures by myself, it's my thing. But for you, I did not give you the right to promote me like this. So that's what, like, that was the main problem. Whatever you do on your own and whatever you agree to, same thing for a regular job. If you work at a McDonald's and you're flipping burgers and you bend over and your boss takes a picture of your ass, it's like, hey, no, you work for McDonald's. I can sell your ass. No, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. Right. So people have to see it as a regular job. When you agree to this job, that's what you do. That's what you're paid for. And of course, we know that they're going to use the, the footage on, on their CCW studio and they're going to sell DVDs. We're completely aware of that. It's fine. But it's just the using this and then flip it and sell it as something else. That's the problem. Yeah, for sure. And I'm women and I'm sure men too on this on the same subject, we know that not everybody is tuning in for the athletic portion of it. Yeah, whatever we, but like you said, whatever they do in their own time, that's them. Like yeah. it's none of our business at that point. But it is our business when, like you said, we signed up for a professional wrestling match where we're putting our bodies on the line to mm-hmm. entertain somebody in an athletic performance, not a sexual performance. Exactly. Mm. It's just crazy. And, you know, to it's 2020 and that we still have to deal with this. You know yeah, what I mean? I think, yeah, I think that, that was like one of the things I was like, I can't believe I'm doing this again. Because I did it before in the past, <laughs> but I'm doing this in 2020 when everybody's talking about the women's evolution and everything. I'm like, yeah, but backstage, there's not so much an evolution when this is still happening. I mean, there's a great evolution because now you're going to see the guys wanting to work the girls and the girls together having great matches. Everybody's properly trained or almost everybody. Mm-hmm. When I started, they just wanted to throw two girls in the ring, didn't care if we would hurt each other. They just wanted a girls match. And it was terrible. But now everybody's trained. Uh, like there's great schools. The guy wants to work the girls. They're going to take care of them. They're just not going to beat them up. They, they're going to work together and producing a great match. And I mean, there's such an evolution on this side, but then you got, you got situations like this where like, oh God, like, let's go back to the attitude now. <laughs> like, why don't we jump in old gravy again? I'm like, oh man. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and you mentioned like when you got started, which 
23 years in the business. So we're talking, it was 24, <laughs> 24 now. So yeah, we're talking, <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking what 1996, you had your first match. 97. 97. 97. Okay. So 1997, obviously we're in the prime era of, of the attitude era, <laughs> as you mentioned, and you yep. come in and I did a whole bunch of research on you, which I learned so much crazy stuff. Like I've known you for years and like half of this, I didn't even know, but like you came into the business, there really wasn't any other women. And what I was really interested in is in 2000, what was it? Let me see. Cause I wrote it down. There's so much in 2002, someone lodged a complaint against you wrestling the men. Yes. In Ontario. Mm -hmm. And so you were basically banned from wrestling in Ontario completely. Yeah. And then in 2006, because of your hard work and your determination to get that thrown out, they finally thrown that out. But what happened during those four years that you weren't allowed to wrestle in Ontario? Like what, what was the story that happened there? So what happened is uh, I had been wrestling in Ontario. Um, I was wrestling in Quebec. There was no girls and some promoters didn't want me to wrestle guys. So I had to kind of branch out. So I went to Ontario where there's a promoter who wanted me to wrestle there. And he actually gave me his cruiserweight belt. I, I beat one of his guys in 1998. And then in Quebec, finally, a promotion by the name of ICW, the promoter, Serge Blue, was like, you know what? I'm going to wrestle you. I think we can make this work. And while he was, you know, he was seeing something working, a lot of people were like, no, girls, it's going to be, people are going to see it as a domestic violence and it's going to be bad, whatever. He's like, no, I'm doing it. <laughs> so with him, I started this feud. People went nuts. I got his provincial belt. So in 99, I already had my second male belt. And I won it twice. And I, w I started going back to Ontario again. And I was working for the Hardcore Wrestling uh, Federation because they knew I was doing hardcore. I had started at ICW with Serge. And uh, I went there and I was wrestling the guys and there was no problems. I had a table death match or whatever. And um, one day were, uh, there's another show. It, I think it was called Ring and Ears. And they were doing a big show in the Toronto area. And... Um, it was a table that matched main event and I was in there and um, somebody lodged a, comp a complaint to the athletic commission because there was a law, I think if I'm correct, from 1924 that stated men and women cannot be in the ring at the same time. We, we will never know who did complain, but we, the promoter was pretty sure it was an other promoter who was trying to mess up the show. So because the law was still valid, the commissioner's name was Ken Ayashi. Like he applied the law. It's like, if she's on your show and she's in that match and she doesn't have another girl to wrestle, I'm closing you guys and there's a fine and whatever. So the promoter's like, I'm sorry, I don't have girls. There was no girls. So I was like, okay. Um, so I stopped wrestling because I had no one to wrestle. And they would have me there in Ontario. So I kept going a little bit in Quebec. And in the meantime, I started to go to Mexico. And I was waiting, but I was like, this is so wrong. They're telling me I can't do something because of my gender. So I called the human rights, the Canadian human rights, and I tell them what's going on. And the lady on the phone, she's like, oh, girl, you got a case. <laughs> so I'm, she's like, I'm going to send you papers and fill them out. So for three years and three years and a half, so it was papers, phone calls, phone calls when they were costing something. So I don't know how much money I spent on this. So thank God I didn't have to go to court because I was living in another province, but I had somebody from the human rights trying to, you know, going to court for me and fighting. And the commission was trying to kind of brush it off, but no, they kept like, they were really good at, you know, no, 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 you can't do this. This is a gender problem. So finally, um, I, I, I get the call one day. It's like, yes, Ms. Goulet, we got good news. We got them. 
like you're you won your case. We're gonna send you an official paper that said so. And only a few days later, the commission got so sick about everything because I I've also exposed that they were charging us for licenses and insurance and all kinds of stuff to the promotions, but they, we we had no doctor on the premises. We had we had nothing in return of having a commission or paying licenses. So mm -hmm. what they did is not only the law was uh, banned, like they, they, they destroyed the law, but the whole wrestling part of the athletic commission was closed. Wow, that's like a crazy story because you <laughs> just took down the whole athletic commission as yeah. far as wrestling is concerned <laughs> in Ontario. And yeah. that's a pretty huge accomplishment. And yeah, that's like I mean, from there, the girls who came after uh, not only could train with the guys, but they could wrestle with the guys. The women in Canada all had the power to choose who they could fight with. So, yeah, it was a pretty big deal. And for for the promoters, it was so many, like, less expenses because there was, like, crazy insurance, crazy licensing, and all kinds of stuff that was not bringing them anything. It was just literally giving money to the commission to have nothing special in return. Um, I always compare it to, um, cause I, I ran a promotion in Pennsylvania and there's a commission, but on the shows, there's a doctor in the premises. If something happens, mm -hmm. it's right there. And he sends you to the hospital and there's, there's a service that's provided. Right. And, but there, there was nothing, nothing. You could get hurt and no, your friends have to drive you and there was nothing. So yeah, I mean, it's gone now. And, um, a lot of promotions now can run because there's not those like astronomical fees now that they have to pay. I mean, that's like, to me, when I read this story, I was like, I need to get more details on this because this is insane. Because now not only are you like a leader for women's wrestling that, I mean, obviously we know that because that's currently, that's what you do. You, you know, you always voice your opinion on, on things that when the speaking out, was happening you were voicing your opinion there of course the ccw stuff but like you're basically a human rights activist as well because of what you did for well i mean you did it because you were being biased against but you did because it was for you it ended up helping the entire wrestling business in ontario and like me when i was coming up in the business i didn't know anything about canada or like i know who you were obviously because you had a name but like anybody else for the most part coming out of canada i didn't know anything and i think that that's why a lot of people don't know this story a it was about 15 years ago now but b people don't they when you're in the United States, I guess, and maybe you can even vouch for this when you live there, like mm -hmm. you only think of the United States for the most part. Mm -hmm. Like you don't think on a grander scale outside about the history here and there, maybe in Japan, maybe in England, because mm -hmm. of the, the, you know, the British style and the strong style, you know, those things a bit, but you don't know like the true underground Nick grit stories. And I think that's amazing that you did that. That, that's true that's like <laughs> and it happened a lot with pwi <laughs> like for the 500 like a lot of people were like shouldn't you be in there because like last year you wrestled josh alexander and you beat two gold scorpio and you won two championships i'm like yeah those championships were in canada <laughs> so like, <laughs> and it happened like for so many years like when i won the 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 king of the death match and I beat Necro Butcher and then I was in the cage of death whenever they never put me in the PWI 500 and I'm like but I did more than some of the guys that are in there <laughs> <laughs> it's like a running joke but it's like yeah sometimes it's, it's really it's sad because there's a lot of history that happened in Canada mm -hmm. that people don't know and they don't also they don't research right I remember I did an interview and the guy asked me he's like have you ever been in, involved in intergender wrestling? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> I was like, yeah, since 1997. <laughs> like, and I won my first championship in 98, my first world championship 2001. But people don't research. They don't look into it. They just, if you Google, there's a lot of stuff coming out. But right. I mean, very, that's one thing I, I'm always a little bit disappointed. 
people don't research. They don't, they don't look, you know, further. Has this happened before? Is this something new? What's the story behind? Uh, one, one advice I always give the new generation is to know where you're going, know where you came from. I think it's really important to read about wrestling, what happened before you, who did what. And because you're here today, it's because someone down there helped it, you know, pave the way. And uh, I think of, you know, uh, somebody like Medusa who brought the Japanese Joshi to America. And she, she even had like a Joshi style before uh, mm -hmm. the Shimmer Girls, like cause Medusa was doing that before. So she is one of the pioneers. And, and Jackie Moore also, she was, she was fighting the guys and jazz and ECW. And, you know, there's things before China. And right. I was there before with my championship before. And there's like the commission and there's so much history uh, when it comes to, I, I'm talking about intergender wrestling, but I think it's a general statement. It goes for men wrestling too. But yeah, and if you want to know where you're going, know where you came from. Well, that's like I told you before we got started, I was talking to you for about five, 10 minutes. And I was like, I've known you for several years and I did all this research on you. And there's stuff I didn't even know, like <laughs> not even a clue. But even though I know you, I still took the time to do my research. So for somebody who you don't know to not do the research to me is just like a what are you doing broadcasting in <laughs> any way? Because that's just stupid. <laughs> I really appreciate somebody who comes prepared. I, yeah. I love it. Well, I mean, me being a professional wrestler too, like I've obviously done podcasts and I've obviously had, you know, the same questions asked. So like, where'd you train? <laughs> when did you get started? And yeah, I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, I want this to be something different. Like I'm going to do my <laughs> research on these people find out different stories that are going on and talk about something more interesting than what somebody's <laughs> probably already heard 150 times. Oh yeah. Oh my goodness. Absolutely true. <laughs> <laughs> now you mentioned the PWI and another fact that I found very interesting, very interesting about you actually is besides Natalia, you're the mm -hmm. only woman, well, because it is the women's PWI, yeah. You're the only other performer besides Natalia on the female side that has been in every single one of the PWI top 50, now top 100, which 100. I found, I found crazy because like I thought of a couple names and I'm like, I would have thought this person would have been there too and this person, but no, they're not. It's just you and Natty, which is like, yeah. I mean, obviously now she's going by the boat, which is pretty accurate, but I mean, you can put yourself right there in that same category. Well, I, I'm I'm still in there this year. I don't know why my number, but I know I made it. So <laughs> it's thing. I'm still I'm I'm hanging on. <laughs> I'm still there. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a great honor. I mean, uh, a lot of people critique um, PWI because it, you know it's using the loss and the wins, and it, when it's people think it should be about the skills and everything. But I mean, it's it's always cool just to be mansion like. Like you say, I, I've been in there since its beginning. So, I mean, for me, it's an honor. I mean, my, my highest number, I think, was number five. And I've been between five and 30 since, you know, going back and forth. <laughs> but, I mean, not being on TV, I mean, it's always the people with more exposure before. And just the fact that I'm not a TV person, but I'm still there always. And I've been there since the beginning. That's a cool thing. Definitely. And, I mean, you're the only person... Like you said, now Nat Natalia is the only other one, but you're mm -hmm. the only one without major TV exposure that's been a constant. That's just, I mean, that would be like one of the greatest honors I would find. Yeah, it's really cool. Like, and knowing I'm, I'm still there this year, it's like, oh yeah, <laughs> now I want to go higher. <laughs> oh yeah. When I was, I was in it uh, three or four times, I can't remember, but like every year I was like, okay, I'm going to go higher next year, but it's really like you said, not really up to you, wins and losses and how much exposure you get here or there or whatever. But still, it's like, okay, at least somebody's paying attention to what I'm doing. Yeah, I'm in there. <laughs> oh, man. Now, we've had a couple of road trips together. Yeah. And oh, God. I know which one you're going to talk about. <laughs> Do you? 
<laughs> oh, the Wawa sandwich. That's for sure. Oh, okay. I wasn't going to go there, but we can go there. No, we can Cause, go there. Because <laughs> this is a, a debate I have with a lot of people to begin with. Uh, Wawa versus Sheets. And I've always, because I'm from Ohio, I'm a Sheets girl, 100%. I'll go to Wawa. It's not like, you know, something that I find like atrocious, but I find Sheets is better. But Wawa, you got like violently ill. Violently. Like, long story short, that's my match with Athena, two out of the three falls for the WSU championship that I was winning. And I'm hungry before the show. And we go to Wawa, because in Pennsylvania, there's the Wawa. Mm -hmm. And right there in, near Philly. And I eat that sandwich. And man, just as the show starts, I am not feeling good. Like, I see stars. I'm sick. <laughs> I go puke. And I have to go do that match. And I just watched it this week as I was going through videos for a, a little promo clip I was I was working on that's online now on my channel and man that whole match I'm on autopilot I am so sick like I don't know how I left I think that match lasted like 40 minutes mm -hmm. I have no clue like what people don't know is as soon as I crossed the curtain I fell on the floor and we were with Angie Sky then. She yep. picked me up. She picked me up. And I was like, I gotta go to the shower. I don't go. <laughs> so she brings me downstairs in the Flyers, uh, what was it called? The, the Flyers Arena, whatever. The Flyers Skate Arena or Skater, something like that, skate, yeah. yeah. And she helps me sit. <laughs> when she starts the shower, she helps me undress. And I sit on a chair that she puts in the shower for 45 minutes and I'm shivering and I'm shivering and I'm sweating and there's like water on top of me and she's like sitting nearby looking if I'm still alive <laughs> and then I can it was my car and I couldn't even drive because man I was gone <laughs> so she, I remember like I don't even remember going to the hotel. It's such a blur. <laughs> and then, but I remember the next day you drove the whole way and I was behind, like laying on the back seat. And it was like, Ugh. I remember I when I, <laughs> I have no clue how I got through this match. Yeah, it was a very long match. And I remember the next day when we drove home, you're where, like you said, I drove the whole way, which it's five hours when you're wrestling a five hour show. That's, that's nothing yeah. really. You're a road warrior, especially I was probably 10 years in the, or eight, 10 years in the business at that point. I'm like five hours, nothing. I got this, especially we had a hotel <laughs> the night before. So I was golden. You know, it's not like I did a, <laughs> I started at 4am, got to the show, you know, did the show and then had to drive five hours home. No, we had rest. So that was good. But I remember you were passed out in the back seat, and I'm like, um, hey, Lufisto, uh, we're like two minutes from the border. It's time to wake up. <laughs> and like, you're handing me your passport. <laughs> and then I tried to sit because I didn't want a person to think like I was high or something. I'm like, where do you live? Ah, I live in Montreal. <laughs> It's, oh man what a terrible week <laughs> so yeah never eat a sandwich at wawa <laughs> i never had a problem at sheets i'm gonna say there you go see another person to join my sheets bad oh, yeah, I've sheets since then. <laughs> and that's crazy because you live in Pens well you lived in the east coast of pennsylvania well east coast east side of pennsylvania yeah which is so where we have wawa sheets there. we have sheets there. yeah oh things have changed since i've been in eastern yeah. PA then so good thing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> oh, that sandwich. <laughs> Never again. <laughs> oh man, that is crazy. I wasn't even gonna go there with that, with that, but <laughs> I think that's a better story than what I, I was probably. going with. <laughs> hey, you had a horse, so I don't know if it's better than that. No, no, the horse story. I'll save that for another day. That's for a podcast of me and Marty Bell when we can yeah. 
<laughs> we could talk about that story, but that is a crazy story. And once I get Marty Bell on here, we will definitely, <laughs> you, you didn't hit any animals on that trip or any trip with me that I, that, well, at least no. not that I'm aware of. <laughs> no. So that's good. Hey, everybody, just wanted to take a minute to tell you about my friend and big supporter of the show, Apparel Line, Ruddy Lad. My wardrobe is filled with these t-shirts. They're so comfortable, and I am not the only one who feels this way. You can find celebrities enjoy them, too. Everyone from WWE's Big E, Sheamus, Ronda Rousey, and Travis Brown, UFC icon Chuck Liddell, and Conor McGregor's training team, to the Backstreet Boys, In Sync. Bono from U2, Phil X from Bon Jovi, and actors too, such as Chad Michael Murray, and so many more. Ruddy Lad was also featured on Dragon's Den on Netflix. So head over to ruddylad.com, help support them, and make sure raise some proper mischief. Now you have something quite special that I can't say that I know of any other independent wrestler that's coming up that you have and you actually have an autobiography with your co-author, Greg Oliver. Yeah, I mean, um, it's not something I was planning to do. It's not something I ever thought I would do, but it, it all happened because there was like an online convention. I think it was called COVID Con or something. <laughs> and uh, Michael Holmes, who's the editor in chief of ECW Press was asked by one of the hosts, uh, who would you like to write the book? of like and he says i have two people kevin steen and lofisto and as soon as he said that greg sends me a message like well maybe it's time to start thinking about writing your book i was like ah oh, i don't know i don't know what can i say and i if there's one thing i did right in my career i kept everything like every newspaper cuts um internet article like I've kept everything in scrapbooks like from the very beginning old posters and I've also kept all the statistic of my matches where they happened against who who won and the date and so I was going through all that and I'm like I don't know and I I spoke to Greg on the phone and then I spoke to Michael and I I kind of realized that maybe I had a lot of things to talk about. <laughs> and I was like, my boyfriend was like, you got to do it. You got to do it. It's such an opportunity. Not a lot of people get to tell their story. And he was like trying to push me. Like he's my biggest supporter. <laughs> like he's, he prevented me from retiring. And then he <laughs> makes me write a book. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's all that happened after I talked to, talked to both of them. I'm like, yeah, let's, let's do it. And yeah, it was officially announced that we were working on it. Right now, we're just compiling stories and data and, and, and statistics, and uh, we should be starting the writing process pretty soon. That's amazing. Like I said, I, like, I can't think of really any independent wrestler that has had a book written about them that, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there's some maybe that I don't know about, but it's not mm -hmm. like something that happens very frequently. No, because there's people that, you know, usually it's people that move on to bigger platforms that you're like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to read this book. But like, I think it's great that you have this opportunity. And I think it's great that Greg wanted to do this. Oh, yeah. Like, and he's, he, he's so good at asking the right questions. And, and we get along. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm glad he, you know, he came forward and you know let's do this let you we got we got to tell your story we got to talk about this 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 need people need to know that all this happened here and years ago and you built this and he's like he was so supportive and I was like yeah I can say no <laughs> yeah well I mean like I said I did my research on you and and a lot of it is from your website so I know that you do keep track of a lot of things that because like if you wouldn't have put up some of the articles that you did or some of the videos that I watched I would have no idea about all of this stuff that you have done and like I said I'm just scratching the like top of the surface and asking you what I find to be really interesting but I could sit here and do a podcast with you for hours about the things you have done from the very beginning of your career and just go into in, into very minute mm -hmm. little details. There's so many things that you have done. It's it needs to be in a book so somebody can read this, <laughs> all, you know, in their free time and see what you have done. My problem is like, how do I 
pick and choose what story, like what's really relevant, what's important, and how much like personal stuff are we going to include? Because there's so much wrestling details that if I include too much of personal life, is it going to take like there's a limit of words I can use unless I go for three books like Mick Foley or Chris Jericho. But I mean, <laughs> right now it's one book, so I don't know where it's going to stop. Um, like, I don't know what years we're going to cover. I like, yeah, we're in the, you know, writing process right now where we compile stuff. So I, I still don't know what it's going to look like. But like I said, it has to be an honor. And to be able to even say that somebody approached you about writing a book. I mean, that says a lot about your career because somebody finds, especially somebody that's in the publishing mm -hmm. business, finds something relevant enough about you that they can publish. Because like I could say, oh yeah, you know, I want to go publish a book, but my story is not as rich in history like yours is. Like, I mean, like I said, we just scratched the surface. It, it, yeah, it was really like at first when I was asked about it, it was like kind of freaking out. I'm like, ah, I don't know. Do I have things? I'm like, I, I'm not a big superstar or whatever. But then talking to them and they knew about, you know, the commission story and uh, the male championships and, and defending women wrestling and women's rights in general. I have always fought for what I believe was right as a human being. And it's like, there's, it's like your story so much bigger than just wrestling. We need to tell it. And it gave me like confidence. And they were like, what you did is so important and people need to know about it. Because I, one, one thing, I don't remember if it's Greg or, or Michael who said that. He said, I, I believe a lot of people are taking credit for the work you did because your story is not known because you're not on a major TV platform. But people need to know that this started here, and like in Canada. There's that little girl who had nothing else than wrestling. My father passed away. My mom was not really into me being a wrestler, but because she wanted me to be involved in sports because I was fat. <laughs> but she wanted to, to support me. She she paid for my wrestling class and I would I would show up like every every class and do my best and because I wanted to prove that women could do it too. I was always the one they saying yes I'm gonna do the move first. Like it, it was always like it was always about proving people wrong, and I, I built all my career on that, too, because I, I kept, people kept telling me, can't do art cores, not for girls, can't wrestle men if this is wrong, and I'm like, no, you're not going to tell me I can't do something because I'm a woman. I was like, that. I was so motivated in proving that girls can do it, too, they can do it better. And that's true. I mean, you've proven it over, time and time over again, that you are able to do just anything that the men are doing, if not even better. Cause like, I've seen some stuff of yours where I'm like, that's better than anybody I've ever seen do that before. You know what I mean? Like, thank you. <laughs> oh, no problem. I mean, I'm just speaking, I I'm just speaking the truth. I, I, I love wrestling so much and it is so cliche to say like, Oh, it's in my blood and it's, in, but when I'm not wrestling, like I feel long, like I haven't wrestled for seven months now because of the pandemic. And this week I was like, I felt that emptiness. I'm like, I should be somewhere wrestling. And it's like, everything is wrong. I've been changing jobs like three times in the past few months because I can't find this love, this passion, this, and I love to teach and I love to, I love to work with someone younger and build a match with them and explain why we're doing it this way and how it's important to, you know, set up our match a certain way so we create a roller coaster of emotion. And I love being like some sort of agent in a ring general. I take great pride in that. And it makes me feel good because I feel I'm learning at the same time too that I'm doing that. And so right now it's like, I, I design gear, I do stuff like wrestling related, but it's not wrestling. And it's like, ah, it's really starting to be like hard, yeah. Right, and here in Quebec where we both are, they just pretty much shut down everything again. We didn't have yeah. pro wrestling anyway, besides what you see on TV. There's no shows going on here, like there are some in the States. So like, it's really 
hard. And like I said, they just started closing everything back down again. So now we don't even know how long yeah. we're going to be without wrestling again. I mean, like you said, seven months already. We still have a long way to go because of COVID. So what is next for Lofisto? Oh, hopefully. <laughs> well, the only way I'm going to wrestle is if I have a contract then I can cross the border because it's work related and then I can wrestle. Because like you say, I don't think Quebec things are gonna move. Like it's it's going backwards right now because people are being, I'm gonna say it's stupid and can't listen to like basic laws or basic like rules that would make this go a lot, you know, go away a lot faster. I think. Mm-hmm. And it's, 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 it's getting depressive and dark and people are angry and like online and they're being as disrespectful to the government, which I think is doing the best job they can. You know, it's, it's a disease we don't fully understand yet. It's, it's, it change, it seems to be changing every day. It gets better and then they find something else. And I wouldn't want to be in their shoes like at all. It must be so hard to deal with and all the deaths and, and people who are getting sick and uh, my God. It, and I had to stop watching stuff online and reading people's comments because I was getting so mad and I was going back to that dark place and like, no, I need positivity. Mm-hmm. I designed gear for my boyfriend. I designed gear for me. I've been working a lot in the gym. The gym has been helping me a lot, kind of stay focused and stay uh, sane. Yes. <laughs> sane. So I'm like, if they close the gym, I'm losing it. And I'm bad. <laughs> like, no. But I've been working a lot, like with a trainer on a diet. Um, like I, I've changed a lot of my body composition. I feel really strong. And right now I'm like, Oh, I'm so ready to wrestle. I'm so ready to be on the big stage. And I'm like, COVID. And I'm like, I'm so mad. And, but yeah, I mean, the only way I'm, I, I would be able to say, hey, I'm wrestling in two weeks or in a month would be to have a contract so I can actually cross the border. Because if it, anybody who crosses the border right now without a work visa, and <laughs> you're dead. So yeah. yeah, pretty much. So, yeah. And so, so like, I don't want to go like into a whole COVID conversation because yeah, that no. could last <laughs> forever. <laughs> But I mean, it's it's ridiculous. I'm the amount of people who aren't taking this serious. In my opinion, like I have a small child home at home, and like I want my child to go to school. Which right now the schools are open here. Yeah, but I want them to go to school. I want him to be able to go do activities. Like for example, a thing here in Quebec. It wasn't a thing when I was in Ohio when I was a kid. Anyway, maybe it is now. But uh, we never went apple picking. Like that's not a thing. Mm-hmm. And like my son can't go apple picking with his daycare because of COVID. And I'm like, but I want him to do these activities. And like, we have plans to go to a pumpkin patch and a corn maze soon. And it's like, those things are even up in the air because we don't know right now what's happening with all the regulations because Mm -hmm. they're starting to, well, not even slowly, they're starting to close everything down again. Yeah. And it's like, uh, I just want to be able to listen so we can get out of this as soon as possible. But a lot of selfish people out there, unfortunately. Yeah, definitely. So people wear your masks and let's get done with this so that we can get back to wrestling, please. Yes. <laughs> All right, Lufus. So it has been fantastic. I loved talking to you. This has been very eye-opening for me. I'm sure it will be for people who are listening to Talking Sass and even people that have been fans of yours for a long time. But let's tell everybody where they can find you, social media, whatever you want to promote. This is your your alleyway to do that. <laughs> the best way to find me is just go on my web- website, lufisto.com. There I have all the links to my YouTube channel, which is uh, the Luffy channel, uh, at Lufisto on Twitter, Wounded Out Lufisto on Instagram, Patreon slash Lufisto. Uh, lots of stuff about cats and uh, wrestling matches, uh, like pictures you've never seen. Uh, no nudes. I'm sorry, but I'm going <laughs> to say there's no nudes. <laughs> but, but it's fun. Thank you for everybody that's been joining me on this little adventure. It's fun. And uh, what else? Oh, Facebook slash Lefisto. But if you can't remember all that, 
Just go on Mephisto.com. Everything is there. I got sales on my pictures. I got new, I have buttons, new t-shirts and all kinds of stuff. So good place to go. <laughs> all right, Lefisto, thank you again so much. I had a blast talking to you and hopefully once your book comes out, we'll be able to have you back on again and we'll be able to scratch more of the surface of Lefisto. Hell yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you.